talk about bad choices in jail. <laughs> Unbelievable. Bad choices in jail. You are screwed. Folks, it's Tuesday night. Welcome aboard. Murder Hobo Inc. goes live with the talk show uh, Between the Rolls. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you being here. <laughs> follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive if you want to buy our cool stuff. It's down there. Uh, if you want to join us in Discord, it's down there. Most importantly, if you want a seat on the talk show or a seat in the one shot, M Hobo Inc. over on Twitter, over on Gmail, hit us up. We'll try and get you moved in. Uh, quick shout out to our sponsors, Pirate Dog Dice, makers of uh, dice that roll too high. Not this one, but this is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course, oddfishgames.com. Uh, if your game stinks, uh, try their adventure sense and make it stink a whole lot less unless it's the sewer one and uh you know what the sewer one is not bad at all i i highly suggest you get it and just bullshit take a big <laughs> huff of that uh folks uh, <laughs> that, that's no, like, just all the way through go oh, to if you've seen this show before you know what it is if you haven't uh this is our stab at a talk show let's introduce you to the cast who makes this show and allows me to not talk for a freaking hour solid mature audiences only kyle you are up first uh tell us a bit about yourself uh i'm kyle I'm on this show every Tuesday. I'm on the campaign every other Saturday. And then I play a lot of other games, too. Do you play as many as Carol does? No. No. (laughs) Honestly, I don't know how she has the time to play the games and write all those emails. Uh, Yes, I would concur with that one. I think I had 27 of them today from her. 27. Two seconds. No, Next no, up is David. Up. David, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, and we need you to enunciate clearly because you're coming off anesthesia. At least that's what you told the cops. <laughs> you got over, so go ahead. Ignore him. You're fine. Hi, I'm David. And uh, yeah, I'm usually a regular here on BTR or um, our cacophony episodes on Thursday. And every once in a while on one shots that are on like the every other Saturday opposite of the campaign. So I'm usually doing some kind of stupid murder hobo shit. So anyway, that's me in a nutshell, folks. <laughs> Is it me or does he sound a lot like Eric Call Justice fan? Oh, I do so- now. <laughs> Fine. Uh, last what are you talking about? Sound fine, David. <laughs> last but oh. certainly not least is Carol. Carol, tell us about yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Carol. I'm a commissioned mini painter. Just spent the last weekend doing ReaperCon online painting stuff. Uh, and I did one of their panels, which is uh, Women in Gaming, and it's up on their Twitch, uh, their Twitch stream uh, under the videos. With all the other zillion videos they have from the weekend. I also am a longtime gamer and sometime GM. And I think that's about it. Oh, and I'm on the campaign and I'm just going to say this. We're all fucked. Now, wait, question wait. for you, Carol. Now, when you were in the women of tabletop gaming. You beat me to it. <laughs> how many werebores attacked? It wasn't that kind of a. Maybe attack. like a werebear or seven. No. It wasn't a game. It was a discussion on inclusivity. Is how you oh. say. Did you include any men? <laughs> what? Did you include any men in that discussion? Oh. Oh! Wow! Whoa! Whoa. Wow! Whoa. Gatekeeper. So they're gonna say oh, inclusivity. We're so huh? inclusive. But yeah. Folks, uh, we're gonna, with the dress. we are just gonna rake her over the coals all night long. <laughs> <laughs> did you talk about tabaxi or did you shit all over them too <laughs> that's right that was karma getting a hold of me <clears throat> well uh kyle to be fair we we all know that she hates tabaxi she's a that's true. anti-tabaxiist <laughs> uh folks this is the talk tabaxi show men all. watch out <laughs> King of you're going to get neutered. Uh, <laughs> first off, we do a recap on the previous week's games. And next, we go ahead and talk with our main topic. Tonight, it's going to be artifacts, or as I like to say, the big boy toys. Uh, so uh, we only had two games last week due to scheduling. First one was Cacophony, and that was episode one, four, 
four box of enlightenment david you played in that enlighten us i will try to enlighten you <laughs> uh yeah that episode folks is about bad decisions anyway we were kind of sandboxing it um we picked up where uh the previous episode before the last episode uh happened where zadar had gotten uh, a box out of porn he porn <laughs> pawn <laughs> He says, David, it's still it's a speech impediment, man. <laughs> yeah, or whatever. Anyway, you got it out of Hawk. There we go. <laughs> and assuming that it was the, the um, uh, personal possession of Zephyr's father, it may have turned out to be something that Zephyr stole from somebody else. And on the inside, there were missives. Uh, a lot of it incriminating and kind of linking things back to this crime figure by the name of DeLuca. Anyway, after that, we were left with a bunch of choices. We made the wrong ones. We thought we were just casually playing it. Not from my angle. Mm -mm, no, no. We made all the right choices for you. So anyway, uh, it starts off with a seemingly innocuous visit to the local herb shop. <laughs> and uh, yes, next thing you know, Brad, uh, Brad Pitt shows up uh, just in time to see Lucky Luciano. <laughs> Lucky Luciano shaking down the store owner. And yeah, just mayhem ensued after that. Uh, yeah, there ended up being a killing, and yeah, that you guys were responsible pretty much. And um, oh. yeah, ended up with uh, Daphne wearing the evidence and us walking straight into jail. So, giving up your weapons, everything, you know, like future prison bitches. He loved this. So <laughs> this is the stuff Frank lives wrote itself. So wait, is he have like two campaigns now where the characters are in the slammer? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yes, just two. Because the other ones are going through the ruins. Mm -hmm. But that <clears throat> was they come way. out though, they get arrested. They're going to jail because <laughs> they aren't supposed <laughs> to be in the <laughs> ruins. Yeah. Everybody goes to prison. <laughs> Yeah, every campaign, that's what it's going to be. Everyone's just going to prison. So anyway, tune in next uh, Thursday when we and find out what happens to see if we get let out of the Huskow. So. <laughs> the guillotine, baby. Yep. <laughs> that is what's coming up. Right. Uh, next up, as Carol has already mentioned, was the campaign. <laughs> uh, this was episode 145, Statue in the Bay. Uh, Carol and Kyle both participated in that. Yeah. Uh, Carol, we'll go ahead and let you start, and then we'll move on to Kyle with uh, him fixing all of your mistakes. What? <laughs> I don't think so. I usually get. Don't worry, I'm not paying attention, Carol. Carol, I won't fix you. What, Carl? Hey, Carol? <laughs> Carol, Carl. You know what? I'm Carl. not inclusive. You know, <laughs> you can have a guy's name, girl's name, whatever. I don't care. We we aren't uh, inclusive. We hate everyone equally. So that's right. That, that he's actually right. I, I do. Especially hate the Dutch. Especially <laughs> these. I thought it was the Irish. We gotta All get right, on the same so, page. Mm -mm. So where do we? Let's see. Where do we? Where do we leave? Oh, we. I remember where we left off. We left off in search of a short rest because we were pretty tapped out, and uh, <laughs> Lucas had found the way uh the way where we needed to go to find what we needed to find which was the staff part of the rod of catch rod of catching or staff of catching tomato tomato the rod is the second piece it's the right. staff of catching overall oh okay so we, the rod part of the staff of catching um so we so basically we did eventually get that rested because we said we were pretty tapped out of stuff as it was and we knew we knew there was more fighting to come uh thankfully frank was somewhat merciful and he only threw two not horribly resource wasting uh encounters of that i actually figured we'd be a lot more I figured we were going to be like completely tapped out at the end, but I actually still have a couple spell slots left. 
Um, cause I started resorting to cantrips and shooting things. And sitting outside while, uh, Chris and Ernie got the shit kicked out of them while you argued well, with Dewey. But I was trying to figure out. I <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was trying to figure out. Yeah. Also, it seemed like, it seemed like, okay, that would be metagaming. But I was trying to figure out if the statue or something was a clue, but that we didn't. I actually figured they'd be okay for a round it's or two. We what our characters fight. would do, Frank. <laughs> six rounds and let them, you know, suffer. Yeah. We came in before that, which was fine, by the way. Um, David has a drinking problem, apparently. I do. <laughs> so, uh, That's we go, vodka. <laughs> we go we go through this portal and we end up in a section and it was like a portal. In fact, I guess there was a chance we could have ended up somewhere else if uh, the dice had not been kind. Yeah, and doing Taryn held hands. <laughs> well, no, we ended up in the same place with the rest of the party, which yeah. was for two. Yeah, uh, by holding hands. By holding hands. Mm -hmm. you know Skipping what? through. <laughs> Does it occur to you that Frank could have split us up for all his freaking bitches at the party? It's yeah, just Frank, Frank could have. Frank hates it when you split up. So, no. But Especially you would have like, done it. But anyways, uh, <clears throat> I don't remember what the freaking... Oh, we fought that we fought... Oh, yeah, actually, uh, Kyle may want to expound on this because we fought the... Um, the the no. law and the law and one. No. <laughs> We fought the gnomes from that other faction, correct? It's the Derogenous sect. The yeah. angry Derogenous sect. <laughs> who weren't there for reasons I thought. They were there because a Dro lady who used to be a PC on this show sent them after me. Yeah. Allegedly. And I don't know anything else. And Lucas burned up a note. Yeah. There was so I am making sure I sell him real far down the river. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we'll get to that because <laughs> the next session is going to be so freaking exciting. Well, I don't think. skip this session, Carol. Keep going no, about this one. Then we'll talk uh, about Oh, this session sucked yeah. ass, so let's just skip over. There was no role-playing, guys. It was just oh, combat. Man. Skip it. Just bad. I saw that disappointment at the end of the episode, Carol. Nice. <laughs> so. but no, let me, let me, let me, well, I will get to that. I will get to that. Um, but so then we then we decided to try to take rest inside of there because the, the um, ceiling was not caving in on us at that point. Um, and then, of course, Frank has got to throw in some encounter. So he threw in some just zombies that we basically <sighs> wasted without, you know, we just mowed them down. I'm not even sure they, they did get in range, but half of them were dead before they even get near us. It was great. And then we got our rest because, thank God, Ernie rolled a D12 above Frank's. And so we finally got a short rest in, so we can Druid had his wild shapes back. I had inspirations back. Although Sally, well, actually, I can't say Sally because Dewey, even without rage, is still friggin' formidable. Um, barbarians. Thank family. you. Oh, yeah. No, I've always. <laughs> Scott, uh, drink. <clears throat> so. Uh, so then we we do we we make our way through there um, without. I believe we did not have any other interference and we get outside. <laughs> we get down underneath, find a st spiral staircase that I believe was rather rickety. And Manise flew up because he can fly. And the rest of us, one by one, went up. And we open the door and we find we are at the statue of the founder of Yaddle. Um, when we look out, we see the ships are all, or a bunch of the ships are burning. Was the town burning too or just the ship? Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That place is a shithole right now. All right. You guys took a short rest. <laughs> what up? Yeah, but I mean, oh. it, was, it was two fucking dragons. I mean, come on, you know. King's uh, Landing, <laughs> pretty yeah, much. Yeah, basically King's Landing. Uh, so, well, yeah, but we needed to do that. And we basically got outside and was we're starting to check out the statue when my dear, lovely twin sister. <laughs> I wouldn't who, say lovely if she's a twin. I mean, you know. Oh, no, you know, she is. I've got her, a, you know I, what, though? Beauty I, is also on the inside, and her twin sister had that. <laughs> say hi to Lucas mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I forgot about that. This is what I wanted to say. So I did admit to saying it was a little disappointed, but I figured out why. Because I felt like there needed to be more banter with her because it's her sister and she's got a big story. And the thought of just killing her like a, you know, just killing her without anything getting out and just treating her like a dungeon boss. That's what was bothering me. But <laughs> well, you know what? I think having banter while your mouth is full of seawater as your barbarian alone fights your sister might have been the problem there. Because <laughs> once you got back up, the banter started. <laughs> you had muzzles in your mouth. <laughs> Actually, truth, real truth be told, I did try to get to help uh, Dewey, but I slipped and fell into the freaking ocean. Uh, I feel, you know, dice, the dice give it, the dice take it away. That's what you always say. And they certainly took it away there. But Manise, thanks, thank God, Manise is there to pick both me and Lucas fell in first. So pick both of us. Lucas figured out that the thing we were trying to find was at the top of the statue in, I think it was holding a staff and inside the staff of the statue was the rod. Um, and Lucas went up to get retrieve it, but because he has one of the other items, the first item, the orb, uh, apparently it didn't like that much and tried to, uh, it did electrocute him. Uh, so he can't hold both items at once. Uh, so we found that out. Um, but meanwhile, the rest of us were, I got picked back up and we were fighting her. Um, I'm trying to think. Yes. So there was, yeah, there was a lack of banter to that point, but it all the disappointment everything disappeared because frank uttered he basically she was under dewey's foot uh because he was whole he was basically holding her down to get advantage to being able to hit her and she looked up at taryn and probably with a whole lot of rage said say hi to mom and dad and chucked her one of her swords at her and Frank, that was the best dice roll ever. Maybe as a player, I shouldn't be saying that. But he rolled at disadvantage two net 20s. Uh -huh. Sometimes the dice will work with the moment. And I've seen it happen before at the most dramatic times. Sometimes you get the most appropriate rolls. And that was, and that was so epic. Uh, I should have made your roll to see if you stayed on the platform or went diving into the water you, again. You that would have been awesomer. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, it's also crazy. <clears throat> I took it to the shoulder. So, I mean, I haven't even been able to heal myself. So I'm thinking, ow, Cra ow, ow. Crash you through Bushmill's boat. <laughs> oh, that would have, that would have freaking been funny. That would have been funny. But uh, no, that was a great, that was a <clears throat> real moment and I'll never ever forget it I don't think and um, but then keep keep the cinematic going because we defeated her and she was lying there with her throat cut bleeding out so as I reach down to heal her all of a sudden Bushmills men pop up and tell everybody hands up and of course everybody else put their hands up but I wanted to freaking save my sister for reasons and you're a I traitor you're a traitor to the crown See, I was see. That's what I mean by there might need to be another couple questions on that list. Uh, <coughs> you are perpetual. They took, no, they took, they took Taryn slander up against the wall, and we left on that moment, and them asking, "What are you doing?" And I believe we're going to skip ahead to where we're all in jail. Uh, I'm going to assume that you took measures so that, like, I couldn't cast spells. Do and, uh, <laughs> Me? Just... Would, I, would I think of that? Yeah. Would yeah. I think that you would heal your sister on top of the platform? I don't think that far ahead. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. You know, you know my play style. I mean, I did it for, I did it for two reasons. One, for the in-game reason that Taryn would do it. She wouldn't just want her sister to freaking you know, die. She has Taryn's a in. traitorous bitch. No, Taryn is Taryn's a frick, the only freaking hero in the party. Do <laughs> traitor, traitor, traitor. We'll deal with that. Okay, so the thing we were talking about as for next session, though, Frank has emailed us a list of questions. Now it's best for whether or not they will get presented on the air, which 
both Kyle and I are sort of pushing for because we think it will be very entertaining to see everybody's answers. You know, uh, you say that. I oh, don't well, think you got that word right. <laughs> if you're a viewer with no character oh. in this in this race, wouldn't you be entertained by what the potential of what everyone's going to say in character? I think I you're all going to be surprised for the most part. <laughs> oh, oh, I can't wait. I, one of the things I said, I love surprises in the game. I, it, bringing the sister in was the best one of all, but I love surprises and, and I love story and I am so excited about next session. One really. of the uh, investigators is going to be Shaky the Moil, and he'll be working over Ernie pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, so is it what, what? There's going to be torture involved? Even better. Maybe. Uh, uh, folks, there was no Sunday game because, after all, it was Labor Day. <laughs> I, there are some things that I do have to do. Uh, that group is still in the ruins, uh, and they got a crap load of weird minor magic items uh that i think they're going to have fun with but tonight we're going to talk about the big boy toys the hakuna matata the pinnacle the top flight if you will <whistles> artifacts uh we all know what they are we all know that they are super duper powerful but more so than powerful they are wonderful as david zeb cook once wrote in the Book of Artifacts from 2E. Wow, that goes back there. Uh, if you can get a hold of it, excellent tome. Uh, Zeb always did a lot of nice things. <laughs> the original Dungeon Master's Guide, of course, had several things to spark your interest. Um, and uh, <coughs> sorry, lost my train of thought. What is it? What's it, what's it <laughs> Sam, yeah, what did you just message? Don't worry about it, guys. It can be done later. Oh, God. <laughs> Put it on uh, board so I can see it. But they, they, the thing about artifacts is they are not all based on power. They're based on wonderment and beholding the power of the deities. Uh, but they always, always, always come at a price. Uh, some of them are portable, like the Ring of Gax. Some of them uh, the machine of Lum the Mad, not huh. so much. Uh, so let's go ahead and start the discussion off with, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, always a goal, never really an accident. And by that, I mean, uh, I prefer to always have them as an endpoint, not as something you guys stumble across. Uh, David, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you think? Am I right or am I wrong? I think you're right. Um, the way I see uh, artifacts, <laughs> at, at least in my experience, uh, they've mostly been used as like a, like a plot hook or an underlying story. You know, something that the that your players strive to, but it's not. I mean, it can be at the front uh, front uh, part of the the campaign and and the whole narrative, or not you know um but i mean they're i think story-wise artifacts make a great tool to use for a campaign so cool beans uh carol what do you think uh, pretty right much or am i wrong no you're totally right um to me there's such powerful magic items and we're gonna probably get to the fact that a lot of times they're bad magic items um and they do come with a price and usually, I mean, it's great to build an entire campaign around you having to deal with that item. <clears throat> to me, the powers of artifacts, to me, transcend. They go beyond what uh, player characters should be wielding. Um, you know, unless it's like a 20th level campaign. But still, I, I think to me, they are like, they are, they're basically to create an entire campaign around. So that's 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 my two cents. <laughs> Kyle, um, I will argue that uh, the greatest. Uh, well, I'm going to say greatest. That's an opinion. Uh, one of the most <laughs> popular fantasy series uh, was founded because the party stumbled upon a artifact. You are, of course, talking about our Saturday. Oh campaign, no, of course right? not. 
Anyone got any guesses? Anyone got any guesses? Oh, shit, I should I probably know this. Um, that- Excalibur? The no. Hobbit. Yeah, the ring. The By ring. the time the book was figured out, you know, it was just a normal item. And then all of a sudden, you know what? Let's turn that ring into an artifact that he stumbled Never on. heard of it. Oh, Never oh, heard of it. Oh. Never heard of it. You know what? Watch the movies. Ignore the books because they're all trash. <laughs> but, but Kyle, but Kyle mm-hmm. I, think, I think you're right. I think having the party stumble upon it mm-hmm. is fine. But I think a GM, a GM is not going to actually have you accidentally stumble upon it without having built a story behind it. Well, that's the difference between an artifact and a legendary magic item is that there is lore behind it. And I mean, honestly, uh, I was going to touch on this later, but we'll talk about it now. You know, uh, if I've read correctly, Tolkien didn't, it was just a ring of invisibility. And then after the Hobbit, he had to think to himself, well, what am I going to write next? Uh, Hey, look, a ring of invisibility. Let's make it more special. And so I think, you know, one of the cool things is that the DM can just look at any old magic item and then change it from magic item to artifact simply by adding lore and history and um, eschewing that the item is from a different mythical magical age, Um, not necessarily from the uh, apocalypse standpoint that, say, Forgotten Realms... um, adventure time or any of those other you know what a lot of adventures are pretty much apocalyptic they are though right adventure time had the nukes uh forgotten realms that's that's an apocalyptic setting Mm -hmm. look at look at what we're doing in the campaign you tell me we're making an apocalypse for the next campaign you're causing apocalypse that is that is end times right there you really Mm -hmm. that's why it's so much at stake yeah, but I mean, the really, like I said, the difference between an artifact and a magic item is that the artifact um, has history in your campaign, your world in some way, shape, or form, uh, whether it's the hand or eye of Vecna, which seems to crack. Or leg. Or oh, leg. Or is, are we missing the leg? Is the leg in the catacomb somewhere? <laughs> Should we have to look? That's in right, Cathaway. <laughs> They made the head of Vecna, you know. That is out there somewhere. It was an April Fool's. It's not as good because they're missing an eye, though. So. Well, yeah, but people. I have a comment for major audiences only. No, (laughs) no, I know where that's going. No, they made it. Is there like a skull fucking joke? There you go. Okay, okay. I wasn't sure. I had to ask. See, I, I just kind of lifted up and let Kyle hit that one for me. No, basically, um, you? The, the was the head of Vecna they did as an April Fool's joke, and people did use it in their games. And I did hear stories of people taking off their head to replace it. Oh, no, 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 no. You hang out with a lot no. of odd No, 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 no. Well, you could say yeah. that because it's our sponsor. They're awesome. But no, no, I read about it. There were stories on the internet about GMs would put it out there. Well, that just sounds like doo-doo. Speaking of which, pirate dog dice. <laughs> I think you roll shit now. Wait until you get pirate dog poop dice. You'll really roll shit. <laughs> You're the only one that gets pirate dog poop I dice. Know, Damn, know. Skippy, I'm going to rub it in all your faces. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, stumbling upon a magical item is or an artifact is perfectly fine. And in fact, you don't even really have to make it an artifact at the time. You just think about it later on when you're bored. Like, yeah, I don't know how to screw the party anymore now that they're in jail. Or suddenly the bar just decides to cast legend lore and then all of a sudden <laughs> Yeah, how many yeah. tattoos are you going to have by the end of this game there, uh, Kyle? <laughs> Several. <laughs> uh, you know what? I, I'm going to say I like mm-hmm. the answer. I had not considered that. Uh, I I did like Tolkien. I read everything up to the Silmarion because that thing is a home yeah. crap. <laughs> uh, yeah. We're going to discuss that one in another show about lore, but... <laughs> Uh, Unfinished Tales was almost palatable, but uh, yeah, I you know what I, I do like that sense of it, but 
But at some point in time, the ring wraiths are going to come looking for you and you're going to be wondering, why are the high level liches trying to kill me? <laughs> uh, and then you have the bard do legend lore. Uh, okay, so uh, next up, uh, they're always guarded. Well, and you know, I can't say that with Kyle's explanation. <laughs> no, Usually that's they're safeguarded uh, by some powerful being or some impossible. If I may, real quick. Scott, sure. you better be finishing the whole bottle off of my answer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> safeguarded by some powerful being. Yeah, yeah. it it Go. like Carol said in twentieth level campaigns and up when you guys are out there going to artifact Walmart and collecting that shit, <laughs> they should always be having the big bad guy covering it. But with Kyle's approach, uh, that is certainly not it, and uh, they have to get the powerful guardians resurrected causing immediate chaos all over the world. Like, you know what? Why didn't the ring wraiths just lay waste to everything? I mean, they didn't do shit in town other than stab pillows. Think about it. They, they could have killed everybody. Yeah, but do you them. kill everybody or do you get the <laughs> ring that's making its way out of town? While you're uh, I play fighters. It's a bulldozer effect. I, I will get the monster in the forest by burning down the forest. There you go. That monster's dead. Pay <laughs> me. Uh, so I, I would go with the uh, decimate approach. But uh, let's, let's hear from you guys. Uh, what are your favorite safeguards or what safeguards would you use to guard your artifact? We'll start with Carol this time. All right. I will actually, I'm going to throw this out there because I actually did create an artifact. And this has actually to do with Taryn in a much earlier campaign but the safeguard was like a greater 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 mummy like the empowered greater mummy take let's take the thing in the book and then bump it up uh so it was one hell of a big fight actually I'm trying to remember I I, I took it and made it I've actually been writing about the, the, the character for a long time and it was based off an encounter in the game. And it comes like, that's coming with, no, I didn't make it. Duh. There was a mummy and it was in the campaign. That's what it was. So I, it was a really long time when I played that, when I, when I played that campaign. But yeah, it was a greater mummy that basically caused mummy rot within minutes. <laughs> no, no, rounds. It was rounds. Because remember, I'm the friggin' was the one who got friggin' victimized by it. But just to put it that way, I mean, that was, the, and then I took that and I came up with a whole bunch of lore around that mummy um, and around the, to, to tie it to the artifact. So <clears throat> I thought, so yeah, I mean, that was, that's, that's one idea. Have a big beastie that's super, super, you know, hard to kill. Do you let your players know what it is or just surprise the shit out of them? It, well, when we went, took it on, we didn't know what it was. We just, we just, we went down there uh, and let's see. Um, so yeah, when we went down there, we, did, we didn't know what, it, yeah, we had no idea what it was down there. Um, but I think it depends. It depends on the campaign, it depends on what you have in your war. The, there we go, we mentioned war. Unfortunately, I feel like artifacts and war kind of go hand in hand. Uh, it depends. It really depends on what information the PCs can research and whether or not they do that. Fair enough. I think it's Kyle. What about you? Uh, do they know they've got to go to Mordor, or they find that out later? Well, they got to find that out later. I mean, unless they've got the Bard with the Legend Lore spell. But um, like I said earlier, because I like the idea of artifacts being stumbled upon. Um, they probably aren't at high enough level to actually know that. And so I think with, as far as safeguards of, um, items, you know, making sure they're behind lock and key, I think I really, uh, prefer the, uh, unintended, uh, guard, um, which is, you know, you have the ring that was put in the mountain down in Moria and a whole civilization of goblins 
Uh, no, wait, no, that, nope, I'm already thinking of somewhere else, aren't I? Mm -hmm. There was still a Goblin King in those mountains, though, uh, and this whole civilization of goblins had absolutely no idea that there was uh, an artifact underneath them, and I mean, one could say, well, the ring calls to evil beings, and that's why they were there, uh, and so whatever artifact you have might call beings around it completely unintentionally uh and so there's some sort of civilization um or something like that that's guarding the ring and they are guarding the artifact in general and they don't even know about it um as far as safeguards once you find the magic artifact um <laughs> yeah i don't know I'm very loosey-goosey about the whole artifact thing. Uh, two of the uh, uh, one-shots I've written actually had artifacts in them. Wow. So, yeah. I don't remember I died. Well, did you die in the batshit mines? Okay. Well, yes, yeah. I died in both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think you died. You died. Oh God! Maybe. I cut a mimic off his face. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. You cut him. Yeah, uh, if I, I, I had I died in that, both one shots. I think I was targeted in both one shots. You today. were, yes. <laughs> right, but I made sure that first one shot, you got to fly the spaceship. So that's cool. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I got to knock my teeth out on the cliffs. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. I was going to say, you know, I had that same mimic, or not the same, but I had a mimic on my face. My lips. Yeah, they chose which one of us to save, and I, again, drew the short straw. <laughs> no, I made the mistake of trying to cut a mimic and yeah, no. rolled very poorly and rolled a one. <laughs> yeah, you, you right? tested your theory out on me, and I died. <laughs> By the time your character came up, up, I knew just to pull it off. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay, David, what do you think? Uh, who who's guarding it, and do they know? No, they don't know. My idea is um, it's either a, a single artifact or say four <laughs> artifacts that are uh, well, not artifact artifacts. Uh, but so much as items found during the thing and during the campaign, you find that they have, you know, some kind of low level magical qualities about them, but you're curious about it. So you take it to this sage that you heard about and the sage, you bring it to the sage, the sage identifies everything, kind of tells you a little bit about the items and all that, and then thanks you for bringing it to them. And that's your BBG right then and there. Thank you so much. That's good. Apocalypse. That's good. There we go. <laughs> oh my God, that's really good. That's a cool idea. Good idea. Yeah. Like walking into the jail to talk to somebody. And leave that's them. what inspired oh, it. <laughs> I like that idea. Now, we've mentioned Legend Lore a couple of times. How about among its many or few powers that it has, it has its own built-in safeguard to say screw over some jack wagon second level mage with the tech magic saying hey this thing's glowing yay or nay uh kyle you're muted so to clarify so if you grab the object and it electrifies you something like that kind of safeguard <laughs> well, let's just say it doesn't glow blue Oh, like it's hiding, like it's hiding its oh, abilities. Like it's hiding its own abilities until it finds something that triggers it. Either BBG. Oh, it's dormant. An evil sect, uh, kind of like the old rings of elemental control. It's a ring of flying until you kill an air elemental, and then oh, holy shit! Guess what? I can control air elementals. Uh, kind of like oh, it's just a ring of invisibility. Oh shit! Which. Uh, it was just a ring of invisibility. <laughs> it didn't do shit. It just made you invisible. There was no, right, yeah, it, right. It's just a basic piece of crap. So that's a great spell, okay? Well, you know what? It also did, you know, fit the finger of whoever wore it perfectly. Oh, uh, that's true. unless it didn't want to be worn anymore. Now, see that one to me would be. Woo, woo, woo. <laughs> 
boys and girls. So do you have clues or do you allow it to remain dormant? Like Carol said, uh, I'm all again. <sighs> Unless you have intentional plans for artifacts, simply just letting them be really, that's all just lazy DM stuff. If the artifact is dormant, well, it wasn't an artifact when you let them find it. You just decided later on, you know what? Let's let's make that toothpick, uh, toothpick of lightning strike or something. I don't Spear know. Spear of lightning bolt. Spear of lightning bolt. There you go. In case there's any bridges, they need to burn down. That's true. Yeah. Uh, essentially, a magic item or an artifact that lies dormant until later on is really just a useless item that the DM is like, you know what? Let's expound on this a little bit. And I'm going to introduce my lore through an artifact. Fair enough. And David? it's great oh, lazy DM writing. Let's just say that. <laughs> La- lazy DM writing sometimes is the best kind. Yes. Uh, because nobody screws over the party like the party. <laughs> uh, David, what do you think? Uh, dormant or, hey, I'm an artifact. Use me. Um. You are evil now. Quasi dormant. Uh, say something destroyed, and then part of it found, and maybe like through communion, through uh, communing with a, a deity or whatever, you find out there's a little more to this. And you bring it to a skilled artisan to kind of identify it, and then they tell you maybe I can fix this. You go on a quest. <laughs> yeah. You know, you go on a quest for the materials, you come back, and next thing you know, you've got this this incredible item that you're discovering. An so. evil jeweler has an incredible item. Sure. <laughs> okay. But but that's my that that's my hook into it. There you go. Carol? All I'm gonna say is the rod of seven parts. There's a magic item that was broken up into seven parts. You can put all seven parts in a campaign and have people find them. And it would be dormant. It's actually like the rod of catching. The rod of catching. I don't know if that's... One might say a copyright violation. Well, (laughs) yeah, but that... But it's a little different. I think the rod of seven parts, it's just a rod. I don't remember if there's any fancy shit on it or anything like that. The rod of catching, you have three real distinct parts to it. And it's basically the same thing. It's going to be more or less dormant until you put that thing together. So I think absolutely you can do it. Now, as for the lazy, I don't know if it's lazy writing. If you plan for that from the beginning and you figure that into your campaign, it's dormant for now, but you have absolute plans of getting that information of what it really is into the hands of the PCs and having them you know, go and find the other parts and make it not dormant anymore. Sure, uh, you plan it from the beginning, be like, you know what, this is going to be an artifact. That, that's what but I'm But then saying. you're like, okay, Lena, let's set this aside. Let's go through those characters' backstories. And once they've gone through it and they're complete about it and they're like, you know what, why are we adventuring anymore? Bam, the artifact activates. You find the tome that says, hey, you can always use this to resolve the problem. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go ahead and stick with that theory uh, and put it in the campaign. So far, you have two of the three parts. What do the two parts that you found do? We don't know. (laughs) They electrocute whoever is holding them. (laughs) All we know is that you that one person can't hold both items. Should be real easy to put all three pieces together, I mean, won't it? Oh, I just know. imagine. <laughs> I've, I've thought about that um, after this week. I'm like, oh, that's going to be. Well, I would assume then. Painful is what that's going to be. <laughs> well, let's face it. Everyone's going to look at Dewey and be like, "You do it, Dewey." i think it would take three of us trying to put basically one person putting one part one hold your end still damn it yeah it's gonna be something like that i mean i could see to give the dm ideas i could see maybe dexterity checks or something so you don't accidentally grab the thing and electrocute yourself i could see something like that that's that's how i figure it could go 
I don't know. I don't know if the parts have any powers to them. They had, don't seem to, although we just got part two. But Lucas has been carrying around part one, um, and he doesn't seem to have any interesting magic powers that he's, you know, developed. That is, that is true. So I don't. I think it's going to have to. Other than the whatever this, and who knows. Maybe, maybe somebody put some sort of ward on it so that when you bring that, maybe someone doesn't want to put back together and put that as a protection on it. I mean, that's it that's was Alvin it. Knackle. Could be Alvin Knackle. Yeah, no, wouldn't that be really cool if you just tie? As I love tying everything together, and that would be kind of neat. Maybe it's a it. different person from your past. Oh, Dewey's, because that would make sense. The angry Derogenous sect. <laughs> the Derogenous zone. Oh my god. <laughs> led by <laughs> led by what's his face. I don't have the notes in but front yeah, of me. But yeah, that's that that would be my thoughts on on it. Um as to whether or not how true any of that is, it's all spitballing. The mm -hmm. only one that goes is Frank. Okay, so Kyle, uh what do you think? Should each one of these parts have standalone powers or do you think it should be you know it's just going to have one power and you got to get all three pieces i mean it's for whatever works with the campaign man i mean if your party is underpowered and they need a little you know, something to pick them up to in order to get to the rest of the campaign i'd say absolutely give each part a, a power that does something and when you unite them all you get captain planet Wait, what? <laughs> oh, Voltron? Megatron! Voltron. <laughs> I'm sticking with Captain Planet, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You just hope to God you don't find the heart ring first, because that, that's shit. Get fire. Get fire, yeah. Or Earth. <laughs> David, what do you think? Uh, I like the, the idea of the parts. Um, you know, uh, that kind of make up the hole being difficult to find <laughs> and um i don't know I, I i don't know the things things that i like when it comes to like parts putting together is just the 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 unknown factor about it so you know you don't know how any or if any of it is magical until suddenly you start trying to put them together or accidentally it's just like oh wait this shit's starting to react you know that kind of thing i don't know it's but, a chemical reaction maybe yeah. Yeah, the parts will just come together automatically too <laughs> no, but, <laughs> I don't know. for the no. sake of the game i really actually hope not and i hope it's something that we have to really puzzle our way through because that's me I am going to electrocute the shit out of you guys. <laughs> One of the things that I like, and I got this this inspiration from Kill Kill Bill with the Hanzo sword. <laughs> you have this ingot. It's a magical ingot. You, you you have no idea what it is until you take it to somebody, and they're just like, "Wait, I think I know what what I can do with this," and then create something. Next thing you know, it. Hey, don't harsh my buzz for this last session. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll harsh stop there. <laughs> Okay, good answer. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I've brought up common medieval household items. So each one of you is going to go ahead and get an item. I want you to tell me what its main power oh, is. Fuck. Maybe what a secondary power is and what a, a side effect is going to Hold be. Hold on, let me just okay. pull out my completely yeah. original notes. <laughs> and, uh, I'll figure something out, guys. And, and, It'll be great. I, I will give you guys just a minute or two to go ahead and coalesce your thoughts, uh, and I'll just banter on about stupid shit. I, so, D David, you're going to get uh, a jug. Okay. With a handle. Okay. You're going to get something. Carol, you are going to get a goblet, a crystal goblet, uh, with something bezeled into it. What do you mean by that? Uh, carved into the side and Kyle I'll give you I am 
I feel like you're pulling a usual suspects here. If we turn the camera around, there's going to be a jug. There's a goblet. With yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll give you the cauldron. The, the cauldron, cauldron should be easy. It's cauldron. Oh, come uh, on. But yes, I, I'm looking at Pinterest. So there's a lot of jugs on here. So <laughs> folks, uh, what I want him to do is I just want him to come up with some quick artifact that's oh, quasi-powerful and quasi-dangerous. Uh, the best uh, tool that I can offer is uh, the second first second edition dungeon master's guide uh where each of the artifacts listed there gave you slots on what it could do uh the teeth of the relic cleric there were 32 of them each one of them had a different kind of power you can go ahead and roll randomly or you can just assign it uh vis-a-vis -vis page 162 of the dungeon master's guide and it gave you all the minor powers major powers that you could choose side effects uh malevolent major malevolent things like that uh i'll go ahead and start uh a copper lid um uh, it's actually a shield that can reflect uh magical spells at it uh but anything uh that rolls a critical hit or you roll a critical fumble it will be amplified and it will cause two to three times more damage uh i'll call it the chester copper pot lid because i have zero inspiration this week i'm not even <laughs> uh so that's that that is the example i'm going to use uh it it can deflect stuff but side effect it can also kick the shit out of you so uh, kind of cool it's an innocuous weapon uh but useful for somebody who wears a tin pot on their head as uh, <laughs> armor and that going with kyle's theory uh, could be found almost immediately and it's your lucky pot because you have culinary skills as your secondary <laughs> thing all uh, right real quick make it an artifact now what's the lore behind the lid uh, the lore is it comes from the Brazier of the Gods, uh, and it <laughs> controls fire. The god of barbecues lost his lid one day, and it fell down to earth. When Poseidon wanted <laughs> marshmallows, uh, they burnt him, and he flipped them down, and it fell to earth, getting lost in the mountains, and it was picked up by a weary traveler. Uh, one of its uh, nice side effects is anything that you cook in it tastes delicious. Ah, shoot. Dang it, Frank. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you got a cauldron. I don't know what the, you know, there, there should have been something else in here, but it's all got cups and goblets and bullshit. Yeah. Um, why would you look on Pinterest? That's, that's all that's I, I, I actually Googled, uh, uh, common medieval items. Uh, Turns out they were only interested in eating and drinking. Imagine that. <laughs> Survival of the fittest. Oh, you know what? You could have picked like a tool or something, you know, like a shovel or a pitchfork or something, because I'm pretty sure they were around back then. Yeah, Hammer. Well, no, they weren't. Nope. You had they were just eating and drinking. Okay, seeing? David, we'll start with you. What'd you come up with? Well, uh, the jug, uh, pretty innocuous. Um, it is <coughs> discovered or whatever <laughs> somehow i don't know uh that for example if you put sand in the jug itself one of the the properties that you find about it is that it creates water and it turns out that this item uh actually comes from the plane of water and it was perhaps uh, a vessel for a god to come and relieve drought in areas of drought. I but like now that. this thing is has been lost. It's now found. You unknowingly activated. Yeah, or you know, you find out. Oh, I can produce water and all that. Well, without special attunement or some kind of command word from an ancient language or something like this this thing does not stop making water it just keeps coming and so it's just, floods yes yes nicely done yep uh carol all right so the crystal goblet uh i'm calling it 
Hmm. Actually, I call it the Goblet of Healing. So the minor power, I was thinking like a Hero's Feast, because um, that does give you temporary hit points and such. It makes you stronger. Um, but the major power, it can heal you to, drinking from it can heal you to full or even resurrect somebody. Uh, the drawback, though, is uh, too much use. Well, it, you can become addicted to it, and therefore you can also become very possessive of it. Uh, if I was to do war on this, uh, there have been uh, people have killed each other over it because of this greed. Um, and what they said, and it was created by a warlord in the time of war as an answer to a prayer. So it was a miracle. Um, basically this warlord wanted to tip the scales of the war he was fighting oh, bring, okay. bring him back his men but then they become all addicted and then eventually they start fighting each other nice I, i'll buy that one <laughs> last but not least kyle all what right so a cauldron hey great wonderful let's start off with uh uh minor magical abilities the owner of the cauldron uh, gets double proficiency in cooking utensils, uh, as well as the ability to uh, cast the cantrip, create bonfire, um, which, you know, great for starting a fire and everything like that. It has a, a extra duration for that cantrip uh, when the pot is set upon it. Um, then um, what the cauldron allows the uh, person to do is that once a week, uh, the party who takes a short rest and eats something from this cauldron um, gains the benefit of a long rest as opposed to a short rest uh, once a week. Um, however, over time, uh, uh, the uh, owner of the cauldron will find uh, new food to be the only thing that's palatable. Anything that he's eaten before, venison, just starts to taste like ash. Uh, if he tries to eat boar or anything like that, something that he's cooked before, it tastes awful. Everyone else who eats from the cauldron begins to lose a sense of flavor as well until eventually the owner of the cauldron will find a certain type of meat is the only thing that is palatable anymore. Flesh. Human flesh. This is the Cauldron of Donner. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, and it is an artifact uh, uh, from a <laughs> from a clan of Ithaqua worshippers, which is where uh, uh, Cthulhu origins of the Wendigo come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was said that this pot was owned by this clan until eventually they ate themselves and someone just found it someday. And so yeah. wherever this pot goes, uh, the more power it gathers, the colder the surrounding area gets and uh, Wendigos will start popping up and eating people. Oh my God. Even in the tropics? Even in the tropics, although it takes a little bit longer. Wow. Oh, folks! There you go. I uh, seem to have like this running theme, by the way. Of <laughs> yeah, what? you know, I'm starting to worry, man. Although, to be fair, human flesh is delicious. How do you know? Like, oh, do you, you don't know? ask those questions. Don't Read ask. His rights there, <laughs> Your Honor, uh, folks. There it is: the lid of copper pot, the font of Oceana, the goblet of healing, and of course, the cauldron of Donner. There's four artifacts. Uh, sick them on your players. Uh, they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> players are delicious, so the items are delicious. Yes. I, well, I, I can't say that because some of my players are not delicious. Oh, that is know, where the flavor's style. at. That's true. Uh, let's do final thoughts and wrap it up. Uh, we started with David. We'll start with We'll end with David, so we'll start with Kyle. Kyle, final thoughts. Artifacts. Uh, artifacts are evil, horrible, terrible, awful <laughs> things. We'll talk about why later, but not right now. In the uh -oh. Lord. Also, to be fair, 
if you give me a cauldron and I have to make it evil, of course we're going to eat people. Come on. <laughs> you are the Udu clan. To be fair, I don't think anyone in the Udu clan actually eats or is a cannibal. Let's go ahead and watch some of the shows in the archive. Uh, uh, as I think that's it'll prove odd, me right. <laughs> I think that's an odd fish remark. Uh, here are all final thoughts. I don't remember what the hell he was eating before because he was eating people or something in the last session. That wasn't uh, an Udu, though. That was uh, that was Jub Jub. Oh. Jub that was Jub Jub. The yeah. barbarian who ate a slime. Oh, God. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, artifacts are fabulous to build in around. So, you know, go ahead. Don't be afraid to use them. Um, and don't be afraid to screw your party over like Frank is surely going to screw us over. With no. This I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Frank is giving the party opportunity to screw each other over. That's right. true. Oh, we're totally going to do that, too. You're just mad because I rolled the doubled mat 20. Uh, David, no, why would that, be, that was epic, man. Uh, artifacts. I mean, they're great um, for driving your campaign. And uh, also, I mean, if you're creating an artifact, it's a great way for you to write lore for your campaign. Yeah. So. Ooh, I like the foreshadowing of next week. There you go. <laughs> But that's my thought. It's just uh, they're a very useful tool. So agree. Uh, my opinion: uh, devil's advocate them. Give them something good. Give them something equally, if not worse, uh, that adversely affects <laughs> your players. Uh, that way, you don't skew your campaign one way or the other. Uh, Kyle's example: uh, Bilbo's ring, just a shitty ring of invisibility. That's it. That's the only thing it did. Uh, folks, this has been Murder Hobo Inc. Between the Rolls. Thanks for joining us. Follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our YouTube archive. If you want to pick up some cool stuff, I think today might be the last day for the sale. Uh, it's down there. If you want to join us in Discord, it's down there. Most importantly, if you want to join us on the talk show or on a one shot, which is Saturday night, uh, M Hobo Inc. Twitter gmail hit us up let us know uh thank you pirate dog dice thank you oddfishgames.com for being our sponsors we appreciate it for all of us here at murder hobo inc we will see you on thursday with david in cacophony bye everybody have a good night uh, eat people